Good morning, folks. If we could start gathering, it's about 10.17. And while I'm getting everybody's attention, um, if we could just remind. Uh, And while we're getting everybody's attention, I'll just remind you all, if you would, uh, during the question and answer uh, section, after our speaker has spoken, uh, wait for the uh, microphone. We want to be sure to catch everybody's questions, both for in the room and uh, we are recording this as well. So we will come around and find you with a microphone. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Elizabeth Watts Pope, and I'm the curator of books at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Massachusetts and I am thrilled to uh, be a new member serving on the board of the ESA. So I hope to talk with all of you about your um, plans for the future for ESA. Uh, but my goal here today, or my job, is to introduce um, Margaret Salazar Porzio. She is the curator of Latino and Latina history and culture in the division of home and community life at the Smithsonian, Natural, sorry, Smithsonian National Museum of American History. Her interests include 20th century visual and material culture of the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, race, immigration, and natural, or sorry, national identity in U.S. urban history, and K-12 education. She um, has recently co-curated an exhibition on American cultural identity and immigration called Many Voices, One Nation, and she was also the lead editor of the exhibition book um, that was published that year. One of the top choices um, recently named one of Choice's Outstanding Academic Titles for 2017. Uh, she is also involved in a number of projects, including Latinos and Baseball in the Barrios and the Big Leagues, which has 30 partners in 14 states. Before coming to the Smithsonian, Salazar Porzio earned her master's in 2008 and PhD in 2010 from the University of Southern California. She has had a number of other positions as lecturers, um, many fellowships, um, but I, one of the things that we are most grateful to her for is um, the article that she's included in your keepsake. So take a look at that wonderful piece. And we look forward to hearing her right now. Uh, doctor. Hello. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Good morning, everyone. Thank you to Barbara and to Mary Beth um, for organizing this conference and bringing us all here to get together today. Um, thank you, Henry, for getting us off to a great start. Um, I'm going to talk about ephemera across borders, how Latino immigration has evolved in the late 20th century. And as we all know, Mexicans and Latinos have been in the US before it was even called the US. But more recently, Latino immigration has taken on new meaning and importance in our society. So I'm going to start with a little history of the Smithsonian, which kind of mirrors historical practices for documenting this Latino history. Um, and from my perspective, as a curator of Latinx history and culture at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, and a federal employee with an office on the National Mall in the shadow of the Capitol and the White House, I am aware of the great responsibility and the controversies that we must withstand to preserve these histories for the American people. So as you already know, the Smithsonian is the People's Museum. Um, our mission is really to increase and diffuse knowledge, and it, that's a benefit to society at large. It includes um, you know, visitors from around the world who come through our doors at the National Museum of American History. We get about five million people every year. And visitors from around the world can access our resources and exhibitions free of charge. At our best, we educate, we provide access to information and historical knowledge, we strengthen democratic institutions by sharing this knowledge generously, and in doing so, we inform and engage public opinion and debate. So realizing this role of the Smithsonian in the America of today means both creating the possibilities for diverse representations and remembering our institutional history as a guide. Today, our research and collecting plans regarding the ephemera of immigration look at the great diversity of American journeys and the people who have populated the territory from before it was even called the United States. So rather than a history of settlement, this is a history of unsettlement. From this perspective, Latinx histories come into focus and they take center stage. 
But this was not always the case at the Smithsonian, and the history of our institution has come a long way in realizing Latinx history as it, th that it is at the heart of American public history. So before we go any further, just a quick note on terminology. I use Latinx a lot. Um, Latinx is a gender neutral term, and it's pretty recent. Um, but I use the term in lieu of Latina and Latino. The X replaces the O and the A endings in Spanish, and it refuses to be defined by masculine and feminine language markers in this identity category. So it's something that I'll use throughout the talk, and I just wanted to, you know, for those unfamiliar. So looking back at the history of the Smithsonian, I'd start this history for creating a space for Latinx history in 1967 with the first annual Festival of American Folklife that was held on the National Mall. And in the words of our Smithsonian esteemed curator emeritus, Dr. Olivia Cadaval, this was and continues to be an open air exhibition on the National Mall where Martin Luther King Jr. also gave his I Have a Dream speech, which nicely ties the event and its cultural rights advocacy even closer to the civil rights movement. The festival and its, com and its commitment to ordinary people, traditional communities, and ethnic communities gave rise to the creation of the Office of Folklife Programs, which is now the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage at the Smithsonian, one of nine cultural centers that is part of the Smithsonian. These were radical shifts in the institution, and they signaled a greater respect for diverse histories and firsthand knowledge. But by the 1980s, not enough had changed. Dr. Caraval recently presented at the 2018 Latina Latino Studies Association Conference and reflected on her experiences joining the Smithsonian. She said that in 1988, the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage hired her as a curator and, quote, I think the only other two Latino curators at the Smithsonian were Alicia Gonzalez, who I replaced, and Marvette Perez in the National Museum of American History, end quote. And there's Marvette in the bottom corner. So in 1988, there were only two Latina curators. And we know that Latinx histories have been and are significant to society and culture and, and you know, from well before the American nation state even existed. But the paucity of support for Latina and Latino curators and the underrepresentation of Latinx communities in the record reveals a different tradition at the Smithsonian during this time. So at the risk of sounding like this institutional history is simply a march toward progress, there are a few really important steps forward in the 1980s and 1990s that changed the Smithsonian forever, and that rooted a tradition for collecting the ephemera and first-person narratives of Latinx communities. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about those and then we're gonna get right into the ephemera. So the first, I think, is when a small group of determined staff and their allies formed the Latino Working Committee in the 1980s. And Dr. Cadaval explains that Quote, we were the watchdogs and advocates for Latino anything at the Smithsonian, end quote. And in 1994, the efforts of the Latino Working Committee culminated in its published report entitled Willful Neglect, and kind of says in the title what they thought the Smithsonian was doing with Latino histories. Um, the report demonstrated a clear and deliberate lack of representation of Latinx communities and their histories at the Smithsonian. And Dr. Caraval remembers that, quote, attracting Latino audiences was one of the institution's concerns at the time. And so we, on the Latino Working Committee, argued that Smithsonian exhibitions and programs would not attract Latino populations until their stories were told in these exhibits, end quote. Willful neglect became a lightning rod that would both enable the establishment of the Smithsonian Latino Center, and you see now uh, celebrating 20 years, in 1997, which was the other important step forward. And this center is currently training the next generations of Latinx museum professionals through its pipeline initiatives. So willful neglect and the Smithsonian Latino Center would energize new traditions for respecting and representing Latinx communities at the Smithsonian. And other Latino staff were hired at American History, and they continued this tradition in their exhibits, collections, and public programs, and many, through, many more throughout the institution also broadened the scope um, of representation of people of color, and in particular, Latinxes throughout the Smithsonian. So, um, the Latino Center um, has this Latino curatorial initiative established in 2010. Um, it was established through efforts by Richard Curran, who was previously the Undersecretary for Museums and Research, and Eduardo Diaz, Director of the Smithsonian Latino Center, and it's been deeply impactful as a way to institutionalize these traditions and methodologies for creating more accurate and inclusive representations of Latinx communities in particular. 
So this initiative actually brought me to the museum, and um, I'm very pleased about that. <laughs> and I'm only one among a host of others who are in trust in federal positions throughout the institution focusing on collecting, researching, and presenting Latinx histories to the world. So now, as we seek a way forward in documenting the past, we are looking at ephemera across borders to understand how Latinx history and culture, and especially as it has related to immigration and migration, has evolved in the 20th century. And for me, I specialize in the late 20th century. So I find that during this time, magazine covers in particular are ripe for documenting important trends and moments in this immigration history. After the 1965 Hart Seller Act, the Immigration and National Origins Act, new immigration trends reshaped urban metropolitan America. And it's clear that cities are transforming across the nation, demographically, economically, ideologically, and structurally. So take, for example, this Time Magazine from 1976, the bicentennial year. It is interesting to note that the largest headline on this magazine cover is bringing attention to America's new immigrants. And much smaller below is a headline for children of the founding fathers. The magazine cover helps contextualize changing demographics just a decade after the signing of the Hart Seller Act, which was at the foot of the Statue of Liberty, by the way. As many of us already know, the Pew Research Hispanic Trends Project estimates that by 2050, the nation's racial and ethnic mix will be majority non-white. Latinx communities are some of the fastest growing populations in this demographic shift. Pew's research suggests that by 2050, numbers of Latinos or Hispanics will rise to 29% of the overall population. African Americans were 13% of the population in 2005 and will likely be around the same proportion in 2050. While non-Hispanic whites, who made up 67% of the population in, tw in 2005, will be only 40%, 40, I'm sorry, 47% in 2050. So with the number of Asian people, um, uh, people of Asian descent also rising to 9%. So these numbers indicate that within the next 30 years, the United States is projected to be majority minority, with Latinxes growing as the most, uh, is growing the most and the fastest. Um, this October 1978 cover from Time Magazine reflects a surge in Latinx immigration and migration that was already evident by the late 1970s. And so my second reason for amplifying the importance of Latinx immigration and migration through the lens of ephemera is the fundamental demographic shift in American society signaled by the emergence of majority minority cities across the nation. Los Angeles is an interesting and unique case in immigration history. As late as 1960, LA was what it had been for most of the 20th century, a heavily Anglo city, largely made up of Midwesterners who migrated to the Sun Belt. And make no mistake, the Mexican presence never disappeared from Los Angeles. It was Mexico, after all, before it was um, the United States. Um, but as the country approached a perhaps more generous mood reflected in the 1965 Hart Seller Act, the great majority of the Mexican population in Los Angeles was native born. Then, relatively quickly, the population changed. The Hart Seller Act removed immigration quotas established in 1924 and 1952 which in turn had grown out of other policies dating back decades. Hart Seller had a far-reaching effects upon Asian, Caribbean, and Latin American immigration to the US, and in Latin American, I include Mexican immigration, and initiated significant national demographic shifts and cultural changes. So as a result, Los Angeles and many other large cities and metropolitan suburbs across the nation, um, the foreign-born foreign -born population blew up in these places. This um, particular history was reflected in the magazines of the time, and this Time magazine from June 1983 illustrates the chaos of changing demographics in the present and future of Los Angeles. Mingled with the winding concrete freeways, the space is decidedly Latinx. In Los Angeles during this time, the foreign-born population was growing exponentially from just over 9% of the population in 1960 to 35% as, as of 2012. This massive upsurge in immigration has reconnected contemporary Los Angeles to its Mexican roots, origins which Ang Anglo Angelinos have historically ignored or whitewashed into a mythical Spanish past. 
but history has indeed returned as late 20th century and 21st century Los Angeles is now an increasingly Mexican city. So this trend in Los Angeles is certainly one that has already and will continue to significantly disrupt the color line that W.E.B. Du Bois so famously articulated at the turn of the 20th century in his seminal work, The Souls of Black Folk. This cover from a 1990 Time magazine reflects the shifting of color lines and also racial mixing fantasies and anxieties on a national level. The question, what will the US be like when whites are no longer the majority, is fundamentally about national identity, race, and migration. And how can we talk about histories of immigration without talking about race and national identity? Especially in the post-1965 era, much of these demographic changes are the direct result of large-scale Latinx immigration and settlement, which have become a fundamental dimension of many urban spaces and their cultural politics. So how do changing demographics require us to think the, rethink the study of immigration and migration and the preservation of its material manifestations? In particular, I'm interested in how a museum like the Smithsonian can approach the topic of changing demographics and cultural identities through our collections in ways that rethink the purpose and experience of a national museum. So I bring you three prime examples today of the kinds of ephemera that we collect that are woven throughout moments of historical significance related to Latinx immigration and migration in the late 20th century. I'm gonna talk about ephemera of journeys and settlement and unsettlement, ephemera of solidarity and struggle in a quest for rights and justice, and ephemera of cultural expression in the face of oppression. So I like to think of the ephemera of journeys and settlement slash unsettlement as also including three parts. The making the journey, the part of making home in a, a new place, and the actual processes of settlement and unsettlement and what that means. So individual stories provide important windows into people's lives, but they are also microcosms of larger national trends. Take, for example, the story of Nancy Guarneros, a leader of the Dreamers movement in Southern California. And this is Nancy's green card. But for many years, Nancy lived under the radar without any papers or documentation, and therefore no ephemera to tell her story. She was brought to the United States when she was just two years old. There were no jobs in their small Mexican pueblo, and Nancy's mother, Maria, wanted to provide a better life for her children. So Maria made the decision to come to the United States. They had to travel separately. Maria made the trek through the treacherous desert with smugglers or coyotes. Her life was in their hands in the scorching heat and dangerous terrain for three days and two nights. But all Maria could think about was Nancy, who at two years old was brought across a legal port of entry by others hired by the coyotes. Maria thought, what if I never make it to the United States? What if the smugglers don't want to give Nancy back? What if we can't find each other on the other side? What will happen to my daughter? Maria wandered for two sleepless nights, and she prayed to Saint Toribio Romo Gonzalez, a Roman Catholic priest and Mexican martyr who died in the Cristero War in 1928. Oops, we're not. there we go. And here's a prayer card for Saint Toribio, who was known for protecting border crossers. Before Gonzalez died, he wrote a play titled Let's Go North! Exclamation point that despite its emphatic title, warned migrants against traveling to the United States. But by the late 1970s, migrants began telling stories about St. Toribio coming to their rescue on their journeys north. Some Mexican migrants say that Toribio Romo has appeared to assist them when in distress on the journey. And this card was from the 1990s. Nancy's mother carried a card just like this on their journey. When they got to the United States, Nancy and Maria were thankfully reunited and Maria applied for citizenship. She also applied for citizenship for Nancy, <clears throat> but a typo in Nancy's application meant that it was never processed. And it wasn't until Nancy was a teen in high school and valedictorian of her class that she found out that she was undocumented all this time. She was now 18 and had to start the citizenship process all over again. Which brings me to the next theme of making home. Nancy went to UCLA, a school in Southern California, that supports undocumented student dreamers more than many other institutions. Education is very important to Nancy. After all, one of the reasons her mother brought her to the United States was for a good education. And being a student and going through the long citizenship process was Nancy's way of making the US her home. 
In her junior year, she decided to apply for graduate school. Nancy was accepted into Harvard's education program, and this is her acceptance letter and acceptance package. So when she called the financial aid office to let them know she was undocumented, they said they didn't have financial aid for her. She must apply as an international student, even though the United States is the only home that she had ever known. And she wondered, how was she going to pay for graduate school? And wait, she didn't even have an ID. How was she going to get from Los Angeles, California to Boston, Massachusetts? She couldn't fly without an ID. Maybe she could take the bus. But that would take multiple days, and they do immigration raids on buses. So what if something happened to her mother? How would Nancy get back to California in a hurry? So Nancy ultimately had to decline this acceptance. Instead, she ended up going to graduate school at Claremont College in California. And Claremont has a specific fund for undocumented students. So she's now finishing her PhD in education. And Nancy's story is actually a common one for many undocumented students, particularly, particularly those who identify as dreamers and DACA students. So many are incredibly bright, and they turn out to be pillars in their communities. They pay taxes, they work, but their choices for their futures are limited because of their immigration status. Nancy finally received citizenship status in 2013 at 26 years old. She had been here for 24 years. This was the only home that she had ever known, and yet, when she received her green card, she also received this pamphlet welcoming her officially to the United States and explaining what it means to be American. Inside, the pamphlet tells new immigrants where to find information about finding a place to live, finding a job, and how to understand your rights and responsibilities. To Nancy and to many other immigrants who receive these pamphlets after having lived in the United States most of their lives, these suggestions seem almost comically out of touch. And the final bit of ephemera from Nancy's story is this plane ticket. So why is a plane ticket from Los Angeles to Mexico City about making home? Well, when Nancy finally received her green card in 2013, the first thing she did was purchase a plane ticket to Mexico City. For Nancy, being a citizen meant she was now free to leave the country. And she was free to see her grandmother again, whom she hadn't seen in 24 years. Sometimes making home means being able to leave and come back. So you might be wondering how making home differs from settlement and unsettlement. Well, making home is really about how immigrant and migrant communities have made actual homes for themselves through making a living, establishing roots, finding community, raising children, celebrating life stages, and negotiating older and newfound traditions. Settlement and unsettlement, however, um, the way that we organize it at the museum, is the process of making a nation and defining national identity at different times and in different places. So I would argue that the history of the United States is actually a history of constant settlement and unsettlement. You know, early peoples arrived to this continent, they made homes, they, made, they settled. Later, Spanish conquerors came and unsettled their lives, and pilgrims unsettled this group, and newcomers unsettled the next. Um, but this also isn't just a series of newcomers unsettling established communities either. This is also a process of negotiation in which we debate three fundamental questions as a nation. Who is equal? who is included, and who is free? And the answers to those questions have been debated over and over again, um, in especially in coming out in this history of immigration, when you study the history of immigration. And they're dependent on who you are, where you are, and when you are, and what your relationship to power is. So these different questions, negotiations, and shifting power dynamics are what we mean by settlement and unsettlement processes. And oftentimes, settlement and unsettlement are represented in ephemera that responds to new immigration and to long-term settlement, like that of Nancy and Maria. And at our museum, unfortunately, it seems that it's quite often nativist, it's quite often racist in its representations and content. But here we go. This is an Immigration Watch newsletter from Arizona in 2005. This newsletter was often written by and disseminated by members of the Minutemen organization, a homegrown border mil militia that patrolled the border with their firearms to deter and sometimes incite fear and violence for immigrants crossing the border illegally. The organization had thousands of members in 2005, but today the group has splintered into several rival factions, but many of which still regularly patrol the border. Bumper stickers like this one on the left um, could be found throughout the United States during the early 2000s as nationalistic and anti-immigrant communities wished to distinguish themselves from newer immigrant groups. And this window sign bottom right corner 
um, could be found in stores around the country as recently as 2012 when this particular sign was taken down from a Philly cheesesteak stand in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So moving along, the second umbrella theme for our collections is that of solidarity and struggle of immigrant groups. And to be American means to push boundaries in a constant quest for equality. So over the 20th century, ephemera has provided a platform for people of color to push and eventually break down cultural, social, and economic barriers in the United States. This is one of our most robust collections of ephemera, but I'm gonna go through it relatively quickly because there's so much and because you probably are more familiar with this content. So the ephemera of solidarity and struggle for immigrant communities is organized in three important parts, civil rights and human rights, labor struggles for rights and justice, and cultural responses to these movements. The topic of immigration and immigration reform movements fall under the rubric of human rights for our museum. Numerous international human rights documents firmly establish the principle that no human being can be illegal or outside the protection of the law, and discrimination and abuse based on immigration status are actually violations of human rights. Yet, US government policies and practices continue to sanction human rights violations against migrants and immigrants. So despite great strides in civil and human rights, immigrant workers are still abused, exploited, and scapegoated. And they're often victims of racism and stereotyping. So the need for immigration reform has been and continues to be a human rights issue. These signs show some of the vitality of these immigration reform movements in both Washington, D.C. and, in keeping with the theme, Los Angeles. So here are two posters showing, on one hand, the coming together of different groups in the fight for immigration reform. And below, a handmade sign that's actually, it's really large, it's probably actually that big, um, <laughs> that highlights how people cannot be illegal under current international human rights frameworks. These groups emphasize that only actions can be illegal, not people. In 2006, there was a very important May Day march in Los Angeles and mirrored in Washington, D.C. that linked immigration reform movements with labor rights struggles for justice and better conditions for immigrant workers, which brings me to my next overlapping theme, labor struggles for rights and justice. The struggles for equality in workplaces, factories, and fields, especially from the 1930s through today, demonstrate how interracial unionism has provided successful uh, cross-border alliances and um, these have been pretty successful in fighting discriminatory hiring practices, building local unions, and mobilizing against brutal racism that threatens the livelihood of many people of color, and in particular, Latino immigrant communities. Many of these movements and groups are asking for immigration reform that provides a path to citizenship for working and tax-paying immigrants. Okay. <laughs> These posters were from the May Day March in, 20, in 2006 in Los Angeles. And Nancy, from our earlier example, participated in the march. So you can see how they link labor rights and immigration rights. This makes sense on a practical level too, since many people come to the United States with a desire to work. So Nancy took this picture. She turned around during the, during the march and took this picture from on top of a, a stage. Um, and you can see the enormous crowd of people who marched that day in Los Angeles. And that's her mom. So, of course, this immigration and labor struggle has a long history and a strong tradition in Latinx communities. One of the best and most well-known examples of union fights for labor rights comes from the United Farm Workers, or UFW. Founded in 1962 by C Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, the United Farm Workers of America is one of the nation's most successful and largest farm workers unions, and it's still currently active in 10 states. In fact, in recent years, the UFW has won key union contract victories against some of the largest strawberry, rose, winery, and mushroom firms in California and throughout the nation. These posters show how farm workers, many Latinx, include families, young and old, male and female, and people of different cultural backgrounds. On the right, Si se puede, or together it can be done, in the upper right-hand corner around the sun, rising over the field with the UFW symbol at its center. And this poster is from the lettuce boycotts, as you can see from the images of people in the fields picking lettuce. But posters like this effectively connected the fights for better conditions and higher pay across citrus, lettuce, rose, and grape fields. At the bottom of the, of the poster, it proclaims boycott lettuce and grapes. 
These movements were so successful in part because they were highly inclusive, bringing together agricultural workers from different markets and with different racial and ethnic backgrounds, and including allies and supporters from different socioeconomic statuses. Here is Cesar Chavez at the center of this poster. He's surrounded by a diverse group of organizers. And the UFW movement was highly successful because it encouraged those who supported agricultural <laughs> workers to participate by boycotting lettuce, grapes, and certain wineries. I'd like to suggest that some of these posters can invite us to consider the creative weavings of the agricultural labor movement as cross-racial alliance. They can be a challenge to our theoretical armature around intergroup relations, beyond notions of hybridity and mestizaje, which are inadequate and imprecise in the face of everyday experiences and exchanges that have made up agricultural movements from at least the 1960s. At the same time, this is a complicated story. And as much as it is about solidarity, it also needs to include a critical examination of how the UFW created a hostile environment for undocumented laborers. Historians David Gutierrez and Matt Garcia, more recently, have shown us that Chavez wasn't supportive of undocumented immigrant laborers at all, and the UFW lobbied for strict control of the Mexican border. In fact, we know Chavez stubbornly argued for the repeal of the Bracero program and was among the most vocal critics of undocumented immigration. A poster from the early 1980s, however, shows continued alliances by combining a host of important interracial civil and human rights organizations. The SEIU, or Service Employees International Union, which unites workers in healthcare, property services like building, cleaning, and security, and public services like state government workers, public school employees, bus drivers, and childcare. Now, the National Organization for Women, a feminist advocacy group that focuses on achieving full equality for women through education and litigation. The NAACP, I'm sure we're all familiar, the National Association for Advancement of Colored People, which played an integral role in the fight for African American civil rights and ensures political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights for all persons. And MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, a leading Latino Latina legal civil rights organization. So the poster features four faces of different races and genders under the bold stanza. We are male and female, young and old, people of all races and religious faiths. We are America, and we are together against discrimination. It's kind of a microcosm of this entire collection, actually, to that stanza. The poster links these four groups to struggles for rights and justice, while redefining American identity in a way that reflects racial diversity within a multicultural discourse. While mainstream multiculturalism often depoliticized labor rights campaigns, clearly organizations interested in better conditions for working people found strength in interracial coalition building. Although we don't have a lot of examples of the cultural, social, and political responses to these particular movements in the 1960s through 1980s ephemera, we do have quite a few examples of responses to immigration reform movements from the 2000s. So here's a couple examples. Um, this is a political response. The pamphlet on the right was put forth by the Americans for Immigration Control, a group founded in 1983 and devoted to reducing what they perceive to be uncontrolled immigration. The pamphlet is designed as a rat card that provides general information about what the group is about. The pamphlet on the left is a take on the American game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Except it's Who Wants to Be President? So here's the inside, paid for by Mitt Romney during his presidential primary bid in 2008. The pamphlet provides a series of damning questions that lead the reader to believe Mitt Romney is the better choice as a Republican presidential candidate. Mitt was running against Mike Huckabee, and these pamphlets helped to distinguish the two contenders based on their differing stances on immigration. OK. Finally, the third major theme of our immigration ephemera collections at the Smithsonian focuses on cultural expression in the face of oppression. This collection of ephemera is related to entertainment, art, and creative expressions in daily life. The ephemera of Latino cultural expression is really broad, and it enables us to understand immigration experiences more deeply, appreciate our differences more fully, and spurs important conversations that can foster important historical change. We have so many examples of this, but I'll share three important ones related to this presentation. The first connects with the immigration and labor movements of the UFW in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, since its inception, 
El Teatro Campesino and its founder and artistic director, Luis Valdez, have set the standard for Latino theatrical production in the United States. Founded in 1965 on the Delano Grape Strike picket lines of Cesar Chavez's United Farm Workers Union, the company created and performed actos, or short skits on flatbed trucks and in union halls. These are a few of their posters. Alongside Teatro Campesino's plays, posters and other graphic materials played a critical role in Chicana Chicano struggles for rights and justice. Fast forward a little bit, this print by Esther Hernandez is one of the most famous commentaries on agribusiness, providing social criticism about the deadly conditions in the grape fields of Northern California. The poster format is at once vivid and relatively inexpensive. It was originally used to disseminate shared political and cultural messages from buildings, walls, telephone poles, and other surfaces in the urban landscape. Posters became the voice of a generation, tools to articulate the goals and issues important to Chicana and Chicano communities, as well as our bilingual and mestizo experiences in the United States. The stories of Mexican, American, and Chicana, Chicano communities are told through these stunning and colorful posters. They illustrate the profound role that art has played and continues to play as part of the Chicana, Chicano civil rights movement and our larger struggles for equal representation. Skeletons play a significant role, gesturing to the Mexican tradition for Dia de los Muertos, or the Day of the Dead celebrations, as well as the notion that without rights and fair treatment, we cannot live. Artistic expression can be found in the protest posters that you've seen throughout this presentation, but drawings and prints by artists that provide commentary about legalization versus deportation have also become an important dimension of immigration reform movements. These images can be works of art in murals, um, but they are also easily printed onto protest signs as well, or silk screened as posters to be put on walls around campuses and throughout cities, or even put on t-shirts so that one's body becomes the message. Judy Baca's Great Wall of Los Angeles has provided a number of illustrations that have found their ways to print as protest. Over many decades, Baca developed a methodology and public pedagogy in collaboration with local communities to co-create murals in public spaces, featurizing, featurizing, featuring and memorializing events, issues, and individuals of significance to Latinx communities. This has been a significant and crucial intervention in the production of public art and the reimagination of ephemera. These are a few images from Baca's Great Wall of Los Angeles, the longest mural in the world, which is often pictured in protest signs and posters. The wall features untold and often overlooked histories that reflect both American cultural identity and migration experiences. The mural is a beautiful piece of artwork with vivid colors and a highly sophisticated composition that gives a sense of intensity and dynamic movement to US immigration history and easily lends itself to reproduction in various forms of ephemera. Another image by artivist or activist um, Brittany Stieferman provides an empathetic image of two young girls who ask the viewer to consider education instead of deportation. Stieferman is an ally in struggles for immigration reform. Her best friend was deported when the two were in high school and this had a significant impact on Brittany who has devoted her art to portraits of undocumented immigrant communities and which she composes for protests and, march, and marches. And the final poster um, was created in 2015 and is meant to bring attention to how immigrant families are often separated because of inhumane immigration policies. It's actually a prescient statement given the Trump administration's policies for family separation implemented just last year. So after the 1965 Latino immigration, um, after 1965 Heart Seller Act, Latino immigration evolved. So did its related ephemera and so did our interest in documenting and preserving it at the Smithsonian. We now try to collect ephemera to chronicle the Latinx story in thoughtful and engaging ways. What is evident to me is that ephemera can offer a critical framework that might allow us to imagine our different immigration communities through intersections instead of obstacles. Thank you so much for your time and energy. I look forward to questions you might have. Um, for Barbara with the mic because <laughs> there looks like there's a question way back there.
Are we on? I thank you for sharing this fascinating material, but I think there's a major hole here. My full name is Carlos Arnaldo Schwantes. I have that name because my father was a second generation Brazilian and very, an immigrant to this country in 1937. Very proud of his Latin heritage, but it seems to me that unless I misperceive things here, the Brazilian side of Latin America is marginalized. Am I misperceiving things? That's an interesting question um, because it, it really comes to the question of who is Latino, right? Um, Latino is not a racial category. It is really a category of identity that is based off of um, our relationship to a colonizing Spain. And so if you're talking about Brazil, that's actually a colonizing Portugal. Right. Yes, they do. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Latino is, is one of those identity categories that is confusing for a lot of people. I mean, this I could teach an entire 15-week course on what Latino is. Um, it's not something that's easily answerable. Brazilian, uh, Brazilian culture is often, at the Smithsonian, we include Brazil and Brazilian culture as part of Latino, but other places don't necessarily. And um, ultimately what we do is we go with what the person would have identified as. So do you identify as Latino? Latin American, my heritage, born in North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, so I mean that's the thing is that there are a lot of people who they, um, they are Latino when in the United States, but um, other people from Latin America identify as Latin American, and that's a very specific identity category that's not necessarily the same as Latino. So, I mean, the, the answer to your question really is that, yes, Brazilians are included in, in our collections, and the way that we perceive and identify and tell stories about Latino com communities but it's it's also you know you yourself don't identify as Latino, so the interest in being included in that identity category is something that is constantly up for debate. Um, speaking of Latinx and defining Latinx, how does that relate to the term Hispana, Hispania or Hispanic? Um, how, what's the concept behind Hispania versus Latinx? Um, well, Latino and Latinx is, is really a way of, of um, it, it's, it's a way of um, talking about identities that wasn't imposed on Latino communities. It came from communities. So Hispano and Hispanic is something that was imposed on communities in the census and that really um, it, it privileges the Hispanic Spanish colonizer. So Latino is something that um, Latino, Chicano, um, Mestizo, those are things that have often come from these communities themselves and are what they want to call themselves. So there's there's like there's a really long history about these terminologies. Um, I didn't didn't realize I was going to have to give a <laughs> a, a primer on <laughs> on Latino, Latinx, Chicano, Chicana, um, a Hispanic, Hispano, but it's it is an important question. It's just that um, Latino and Latinx are the preferred now. Mm. Sure. Making you exercise, Barbara. <laughs> no kidding. We're going to do Bruce first. <laughs> I'll get to you. Are we ready? Oh. I was very interested in the uh, personal family you had from Nancy. And so my, my question is um, how did you acquire this ephemera? Did she just give it to you, and uh, even if she did, uh, what, what kind of programs do you have for either soliciting or finding this type of ephemera? 
Um, that's a really interesting question. That's actually, um, you know, so as a curator at the Smithsonian, my responsibilities are research, collecting exhibitions and service. The collecting part really is going out to communities and um, finding leads, a lot of detective work to find stories that um, help us, you know, to uh, preserve these, the, the records. Um, <coughs> With Nancy, I was really interested in collecting from the broader dreamers movement, and um, so I was working with the UCLA Labor Center that has a wide array of dreamers material, um, protest signs, um, graduation caps, um, you know, all, all kinds of art. Um, and in one of my meetings with them, Nancy had come. She was, you know, a UCLA student, and she was on their board and. Um, very active um, in the movement, and I asked her if I could interview her. Um, one of the pieces of, like the bread and butter of what I do is is oral histories, because these people are so alive, and they can tell their stories, and um, and then, you know, in the con in, you know, the context of our conversation, I asked her if she had materials, and and so then we had another conversation, and she brought the materials, and, and so that was kind of how, you know, we, I, we started the the whole collection process. Um, ultimately, most of these objects are, um, you know, they're donations to the museum. That's how our collections grow and, and improve. And um, but um, but in some cases, we'll we'll purchase. Um, for Nancy, she was really excited to donate because she wanted her story to be told, and and, and because <laughs> in the context of our conversations with the UCLA Labor Center, there were other dreamers who, um, you know, we're the Smithsonian, we're part of the government, they were, they didn't want to donate anything, and so I think Nancy felt bad <laughs> that nobody else wanted to donate, but um, because if they don't donate, then we can't tell the story. We don't have the ephemera to, to show people. So, so she felt that it was a really important um, project, and, and I agree. I mean, I think the other thing about Nancy is that, you know, ephemera is often thought of as, as, as kind of mainstream, mass-produced, but for, um, or maybe in some circles, but for people like Nancy and, and for Latino communities, like there's, you know, except for the posters, there's not a whole lot of mass production. It's, it's you know, individual little pieces of paper often. So, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for presenting. I'm Elizabeth Eisenberg. And um, can you familiarize our, uh, the group to the word destination city? Because you pointed out Los Angeles. I was in Kansas City last week, which is also a strong Latino population and a destination city. And can you um, also talk about the upcoming census um, changes to the categories? Oh, yeah, wow. Well. Um, <laughs> so, so I think that... Um, What's important to note right now in the United States is that there are Latinos, Latinas in every state, in every territory, uh, in every city, <laughs> small towns, rural America. Um, it's no longer, um, you know, single destination cities. Um, what was happening, maybe what you're referring to is over, um, you know, the last maybe 50 years, um, a lot of Latinos have come to cities that um, where they already had roots, where they already had family, and, um, and so, you know, places like Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, um, you know, ha were, had burgeoning Latinx populations, um, but that's growing in Kansas City, um, and it has been for many years. Like the the Latinos in in Kansas City have been there. Um, in my research on baseball, um, there's like Latino baseball since like the 1920s in Kansas City, um, and and even before that, uh, you know, Colorado. There there's you know strongholds of of Latinx communities, um, you know, all over the nation, and so. So I, I think that you know thinking about destination cities is not necessarily the most productive in, in current um, you know demographics, but um, but it's important to note that there are kind of clusters of places where um, you know um, people are uh, people of Latinx origin are, are more supported than others, and that's why they go there. 
Um, as for the census, I mean, the census has always been a way of kind of defining communities and, and um, the question of citizenship is really a difficult question for so many people. Like, I mean, when you think about the individual stories like Nancy, um, b before she was documented, like you would just not be counted then. You would just avoid the census altogether. And that means that then, the, you know, you're not counted. A lot of communities aren't counted. And, and then what's, what happens is that the resources don't get put into your communities because there's, you know, on the books, less people, right? So, um, so the citizen question, the citizenship question is a really, it, it's, a, it's a hot button question and it really just means that, that um, you know, people are not gonna be counted then. Yeah. Oh, um, Barbara? <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, question, uh, does the uh, Smithsonian Latino Center include um, the Puerto Rican um, Latino community in, um, in its overall uh, focus of study? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I'm Mexican and, so, and I'm from LA, so uh, a lot of my research I is kind of from there. <laughs> um, and that's kind of what I presented to you today is, is um, what my expertise is. But um, we have a very strong tradition for collecting from Puerto Rican communities, um, Boricuas, from um, Dominican communities, from Salvadoran communities, Venezuelan communities, Nicaraguan communities. We're a national um, museum and, and necessarily um, Latinidad and, and being Latino includes all of these different um, these different places, these different heritages, these different, you know, cultural, um, I know there's a difference between the Puerto Rican experience of the migration experience and that in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we, we collect a lot of, um, like, for example, the, um, the ephemera around cultural expression and the ephemera around cultural expression in the face of oppression, that is something that's felt with, com with Puerto Rican communities, certainly. Um, and we, I mean, it is a migration experience, but it's still, that's why we talk about it as immigration migration. Um, because these experiences, even though you're not immigrating to a new country, this is your country of origin, um, the experience is similar. You still have to find a new place to live. You still have to figure out the language. You still have to, you know, oftentimes the language. You still have to, you know, um, find, an, find ways to make home in a new place. And so those are the things that we focus on with the collection rather than the distinction of citizenship. Nancy's story is, is just one that I thought was a really important one right now. And so, so but that's not the only one, obviously. So first of, first off, great presentation. I really enjoyed this. Um, and it's so timely for now, especially when I love using the word ephemera in contemporary materials, <laughs> which uh, you know most people don't even know what the word means. So when we start to talk, have this conversation, <laughs> it's important. I was at a lecture two weeks ago in San Francisco with a woman named Lana Rigsby, who's a dear friend of mine and graphic designer. And she did a presentation to the AIGA and was talking about the voter registration that she's been doing in Houston mm. to uh, prior to the last election, because um, to, to, there's so many Latina and Latino voters who are fearful of registering. They're, they're able to vote, they're legally able to vote, but they won't register because of fear of some kind of repercussion from current administration, current <coughs> political environments and everything else. They registered, the, interestingly though, they registered over 750,000 voters using uh, food truck and taco truck as their registration points, which That's was kind of brilliant. amazing, yeah. But they created a huge amount of ephemera, mm. um, which might be something interesting for you guys to look at because they're gonna, they're gonna, they're starting it again. Yeah. And, but very, but interestingly, as is typical with voter registration campaigns, very few, uh, probably only a, a percentage of them actually voted. So right. because the fear is so great. So, I mean, if, if there's anything you can address around, you know, if you've had any learnings around uh, uh, whether, the, I mean, obviously we, we see 
these struggles and we see how people are trying to address them. And ephemera, in the way that we use it here, is a very powerful way and always has been a very powerful way to do that. We think of things like social media now and mass media, but, but that's, a, that's a very root way to get those messages out. Absolutely. Um, I'd love to talk to you after this um, to find out uh, who your contact is because that would, this is the detective work we have to do. <laughs> so um, that, that um, sounds really exciting. Um, we also have um, a food history project, which I think would coincide nicely yeah. with this. Yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> I think that like in 2006 when there was that big May Day march and a lot of you know, people came out from the shadows um, to be heard and to be seen. Um, it was really an incredible moment where people felt like they had the freedom to walk around the city of LA w with you know, the understanding that they were with allies, but they were also, you know, many people were undocumented. Um, that fear, you know, kind of, <clears throat> I would say that that was an important kind of moment that it hasn't been repeated since, you know? <laughs> Um, and actually the fear has, has become even greater. What I'm hearing a lot from, from undocumented um, populations and groups is that they're just waiting for the administration to change. And then that, and unfortunately though, that means that you know, if, they're, if you're undocumented, you can't vote, right? But, but they exercise their right to protest, they exercise their right to, um, you know, to, to um, put out pamphlets, to, to make ephemera, to, to show people that the issue is still alive. Um, but unfortunately, it's a, I, I've heard a lot of you know, people just waiting. And, and some people, um, some, there's actually a decline in, in Mexican immigration and in people who have immigrated here, you know, they're going back to Mexico. Um, it's not, you know, a lot of the undocumented students like Nancy, they, you know, their whole lives are here, so they're not going to leave. But um, for any um, immigrants who came with the, you know, intention to always, you know, the intention to go back, um, a lot of them have, have left. So we actually are at like a, um, a negative uh, immigration. And this will be our last question. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for terrific illuminating sharing of the Smithsonian's collections. I have a question about, is it on? Okay. Um, are you collecting and documenting the sanctuary movement right now? Um, we are a little bit. We have to be kind of quiet about it because it's so controversial. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we, we try to collect the things that are um, the most pressing and important, um, you know, right now. And so um, that we've collected a few things from the sanctuary city. Uh, um, there's like a sanctuary, sanctuary city alliance. Um, so we've, we've collected a few things, but um, we're not really advertising it because it's not, so, you know, we're funded by Congress. And <laughs> um, so, so it's, it's one of those things that like, we don't want to raise red flags unnecessarily. <laughs> um, but we collect these things for future generations to be able to use and present that this was our moment, you know, right now, that um, the, these are the things that, we're, that um, are happening and, um, and, you know, to make sure that it's not last to time. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Margaret. Sure.